I'm a doctor, but is the food that you're buying your cat or your dog spending good money on it? Is it actually making your cat or dog sick? Giving your cat or dog diabetes, fatty liver, making them obese? Is the food that your veterinarian is recommending that you buy? For your dog or cat, or maybe even selling to you at a nice tasty markup. Is that what your cat and dog should be eating? These are very important questions for those of us who love our pets. And I've got a special guest on today uh, who's a veterinarian and who practiced for years and years. He's retired now, but he still keeps up with the literature and he has discovered a way to reverse type 2 diabetes in dogs and cats, and also to prevent that from ever happening to your pet. And so I'm going to bring him on. I think uh, I've, people have been asking me for this for months. What's a proper pet diet? So if you, if you have a friend or a family member who loves their pet, please send them a link to join this. Uh, if you have people on your social media that love their dogs and cats, please share this on your social media because so many people just thoughtlessly, blindly trust their veterinarian or their vet tech and feed their beloved family members, their dogs and cats. They feed them stuff that is actually contributing to their disease. And then that requires multiple veterinarian visits. Uh, a lot of medication that you're going to have to pay for. There's not very much in the way of pet health insurance. Uh, maybe there is. Maybe I just don't know about it. But uh, so please share this around. I'm going to bring Dr. Einertsen on. Doctor, welcome. Hey, Ken. Nice to see you. It is a pleasure to have you. I have, This has been one of my most requested videos. And uh, I do have a degree in animal biology. Okay. I went to medical school, not veterinary school. So I am not an expert when it comes to the care and feeding of dogs and cats. But I know that you are. And uh, for months, people have been bugging me, wanting me to get a veterinarian on here. And let's talk about a proper pet diet. And I think the vast majority of pets are cats and dogs, right? So let's, let's stick to them. Unless somebody has a question specifically about another species, if that's okay with you, Doc. Yeah, sure, Ken. Just to be clear, you know, I'm a I'm a veterinarian, but I'm not like board certified in anything like nutrition or otherwise. So sure. just my sure. clinical experience and my uh, understanding of the literature that we do have. Yes, absolutely. So uh, we're gonna. I'm I'll first want you to introduce yourself and give us a brief little intro as to who you are and why all these cat and dog lovers in the world why they should care about what you say and what you've discovered. Okay, well, you know, I. Uh, this, you might be experiencing the ramblings of a lunatic, you know, but uh, I'll, I'll t I'm from Colorado. I graduated from Colorado State in 1994. I practiced in Alaska for a couple of years where I did large and small animal um, and then uh, moved to Rochester, Minnesota, where I've been for the last uh, 26 years. Um, and about 20 years ago, uh, I was reading an article about um, different way to manage type 2 diet to manage diabetes in cats and in general cats are type two dogs are type one and uh i was trained we were all trained uh you know all books were written that you um you, you use a low fat diet high in carb high in fiber and you give them what i what i now consider to be industrial doses of insulin and the problem was it just never worked very well i mean you could never get normal glycemia they're always sky high or their glucose is so low they're in a coma or dead. It was just impossible to achieve normal glycemia. And then uh, this is back in 2001, a ridiculous article came out. Um, would easily have dismissed it, but I knew the lead author and she's brilliant. Her name is Dr. Deborah Greco. And in this study, she did kind of the exact opposite. She put them on like a canned kitten food that's high in protein, very low in carbs, moderate fat and just minuscule doses of insulin. And her results were amazing, like nothing I'd ever experienced. And uh, I tried it on the very first cat. And uh, within a couple months, uh, we ended up taking the cat off insulin, normal glycemia, no glucose urea. That was before we were doing fructose amine testing, um, which is kind of like an A1C if you like. Uh, right. And um, uh, the next cat I treated, remission. The next cat, remission. I now realize in hindsight is maybe lucky, but three in a row 
after going for, you know, all my career up to that point, never reversed one to have three in a row. So I just really uh, dug on into that and um, sent one of my technicians off and she got trained and together, I think at one point we pulled our records and we had like 70% remission. And then over time, as we refined our techniques, we got up to one point at the very top point was 83% of our cats in remission. Yeah. Um, and so any of you guys watching, if if you think your veterinarian might need to hear what Dr. Einertsen just said, please, you're welcome to email a link to your veterinarian uh, or tag them in this, because I think the average veterinarian has no idea about this. I want to and, and I want to dig into that, doctor. What the hell was wrong with you before you made this discovery? Why did you mistreat so many cats and dogs for so many years? Were you not trained about dog and cat nutrition in vet school? Did you not read any literature? How, because you're obviously very intelligent. How did you miss that? Well, I think because I followed the conventional wisdom, the amount of nutrition that we get is similar to physicians. You know, it's not very many hours. And I could kind of summarize it by saying, you know, it's, uh, we've identified the essential vitamins and minerals, make sure you have those, the essential amino acids. Um, and uh, then it's just kind of calories in, calories out from there, you know. Um, and it was, uh, that's as simple as, you know, reversing obesity was just uh, put them on a calorie restricted diet. We were never taught anything about like protein leverage. We were never taught about anything about like, the insulin and glucagon responses. It was just uh, that simple. So I think a lot of us miss it. And, you know, after um, reversing diabetes or getting them into remission, um, then I was listening to uh, some other research saying that, yeah, you could use that same diet to reverse obesity. It was more of opinion than research. And I was like, well, that's ridiculous because uh, as a hypocrite, my own cat was obese. You know, I mean, she was overweight. I put her on the most expensive prescription weight loss diet on the, on the that you could get, a uh, real famous brand. And um, she What's was the brand. Doc, what was the brand? Uh, Hills. Um, Hills. It's called, yeah. Uh, it's like a re reducing diet. Yeah. Um, I, I put her on that, and she was hungry all the time. And she's waking us up at night, and you kind of give in. Well, ugh, just feed her some more food so we can sleep. And she slowly over a period of years went from overweight to mildly obese. And so I thought, you know, it's ridiculous if I could put her on this high protein, very low carb, moderate fat canned food, because she loved canned food. You know, she loves it too much. She's just going to overeat it. But I tried it and the weight just melted off her. We call it the Catkins diet. You know, she could jump Catkins. up on <laughs> and she's doing all this stuff. And I was like, wow, this is completely backwards, you know. Um, at the time, I still didn't understand like protein leverage and you know, all and all that stuff. But um, then I started uh, using that same diet to reverse obesity, and then I started noticing some other things like these cats that have these chronic cystitis, the bladder, the interstitial cystitis, like in people, um, that seemed to go away, or not completely, but just way lower uh, levels. Um, and then the obesity, and then the diabetes, and the hair coat changes and they just seem to be more muscular and more athletic. And I just kind of started to question all of my training. Yeah, no, I totally get it. That's, and that's a very similar story. What happened to me, but it's, I think I find it fascinating that the average vet just kind of falls in line with, Oh, a cat and dog diet should basically be a plant-based diet. Like people, uh, kind of forgetting maybe that there are different species. And I, I want to, I want to, um, I want to pull up this real quick. So that if anybody has any doubts about this, I've actually seen people on Twitter say that uh, their dog was not descended from a gray wolf. And let's be very clear. Uh, I was taught in animal biology that every single canine on the planet without exception is a direct descendant of the gray wolf. And all the different breeds from the humongous, uh, you know, wolfhound to the tiny, tiny chihuahua, they are all directly descended from the gray wolf. That's number one. Then number two, cats. This is the uh, ancestral lineage of cats. They literally descended from the same common ancestor as lions, tigers, cheetahs, pumas, mountain lions. They all have a common ancestor 
Uh, cats are not some special magical breed. Our dogs are not some special magical breed. They are direct descendants from uh, animals that ate predominantly meat. Now, uh, next thing I want to say is I want everybody to tell me in the comments where you're watching this from. Where are you at in the world? What city? What state? What country? And then, Doc, you, you alluded to changing from kind of dry kibble over to just canned dog food. What are the differences between them? And, and why do you think that started to make a difference immediately in the, the, the diabetes? Yeah, well, just to be clear, like in, in cats, that's where I have the most confidence because um, they are true obligate carnivores like your graph showed. And I love that graph on your dogs, you know, just to, just so you know that some of the pushback I get from my peers and the academics is uh, there is some been some genetic changes uh, in that they have more copies of pancreatic amylase. Um, Yep. And some of the dogs, although it's interesting, I read another article that like it's not so much like the northern dogs, like the huskies. That's they right. Yep. Not just the dogs that evolved out of like the, the Fertile Crescent, the Middle East. You know, Absolutely. The, and it's actually breeds of dogs that have been domesticated with humans the longest. They yeah. have the most genetic defects, allowing them uh, having a higher amylase in their in their saliva and in their their stomach so that they can. Uh, break down sugars as starches because they've been eating human scraps for the longest amount of time. And so the longer a, a breed has been in captivity and been domesticated, they're going to have more copies of the amylase gene. That's absolutely true. But that's not a positive evolution. That's them basically uh, eating our scraps for so long that it, it, it actually had an adaptive effect on their genetics. But it doesn't mean that that's their ideal diet. Agreed. You know, and um, and just so you know, like that's more copies of the pancreatic amylase. I still don't think any of the dogs have salivary. Amylase. No, you're you're exactly correct about that. Yes, thank you for that. And then uh, again, the cats. You said you're you're more of an expert in in feline health. Uh, so what's the difference when we change from dry kibble to canned cat food? What's what is the difference in that? Because it's there's nothing magic about the can, obviously. Uh, why is canned food seem to help cats better than dry kibble? Yeah, um, and the, you know the reason I think the canned is is important is a couple of reasons. One is if you look at the African cat, you know we think all of our modern domestic cats um, evolved from, you know they evolved in the desert, and there's not much water in the desert. You know uh, I read an article that said as much as ninety percent of their daily moisture needs for those wild cats comes from the prey that they catch because little mammals that they prey upon are like big mammals. We're all close to about 70% water, you know? And so when you feed canned food, it's about 70% water. When you feed dry food, it's only about 10% water. Now, yeah, if you put them on dry food, they will drink more water, but they never drink enough to be fully hydrated. You look at the amount of urine they produce. They, cats just have a low thirst drive. And so I don't know what's going to be as critical in dogs as in cats. It has to be canned. But the other thing about the canned is like you can put whatever you want in canned. But if you're going to make crunchy, crispy little brown balls that you can pour out of a bag, you're going to have to add a lot of carbohydrate to that. And so that's why I, I think it's really important for cats. Uh, I think probably less so for dogs on the can versus um, dry. Gotcha. So I've had a couple of questions already. Uh, what about because there's a lot of people that uh, hang out with Nisha and I. And we feed our dogs and cats meat. That's what that's what they get. They get ground beef. They get uh, fish out of a can. I buy the super cheap tuna, and I'll give them a can of that. I'll give uh, the cats and the dogs one can of cod liver once a week. And the next question is always, well, that's expensive. And I, and so then my reply, because you know how I am, Doc, I'm, I, I say something to the effect of, well, do you actually love your cat or dog? <laughs> as a family member or do you not because i you know i can hear a parent saying well that's too expensive to feed good food to my kids well if they if they're truly part of your family then you might want to you know buy them food that actually improves their health instead of degrades their health but the question is what about cats who already have existing kidney disease can they eat a, a, a diet that's going to be higher in protein if you put meat and fish and, and uh, canned dog food? Can, can their kidneys handle that? Or should you put a, a dog with a cat with existing kidney function? Should they be on dry kibble? 
I think it's really critical if they have kidney disease that they are on can because we've mentioned that chronic dehydration, right? We need to keep them as well hydrated as we can. Um, you know, the, the high protein in kidney comes up all the time. And I just did a webinar the other day with a, another specialist. But uh, when you look at the prescription kidney diets, they tend to be lower in protein. Um, they tend to be lower in phosphorus, which I think is kind of the, the magic sauce. Um, and they have uh, some extra potassium and stuff added. Um, but I really think it's the phosphorus. So I, in my experience, I've had a lot of cats with chronic kidney disease that we could not get on. We could not get them to eat the prescription kidney diet. We tried every single way to coerce them into it. And uh, it just was a no-go. And but if ever you have a cat with chronic kidney disease, always the primary importance is that we find something they will eat because they become so cachexic. They lose so much muscle mass if you don't um, find a way to, to, to nourish them. So I've had a lot of cats where we failed the kidney diet. So then I end up, there's a website I use, it's called like Binky's page. Um, and uh, I just try to find uh, a canned food that's low in phosphorus, the lowest phosphorus I can get. And I've had a lot of cats do shockingly well. Like we'll come back a year later and recheck the kidney values or six months later. And I'm just shocked. I'm like, wow, this is just as good a response as I ever got from the kidney diets. You know, and those kidney diets, although they're low in protein, it's interesting, the manufacturers are uh, making them higher and higher protein <laughs> nowadays. Right. I mean, not as protein restricted as it used to be. And I, I think there's something to be learned there. Yeah. And I've known for years uh, that the higher protein's bad for your kidneys myth for humans was absolute <laughs> bullshit. But I'm not a veterinarian, so I wanted to hear it from your mouth. Uh, and so there's no credible veterinary research showing that that cats, it, it's harmful to their kidneys to eat a high protein diet, even though they're obligate carnivores. You've never seen any research showing, proving that a, that a, a diet full of meat and fish for, for cats is going to harm their kidneys? Right. For dogs or cats. I've just never found, I think it's the same as human literature. I just think there's a lot of myth, you know. Uh, I've never found anything that suggests that a high protein diet can induce renal dysfunction. I just, yeah. I don't think it exists. And I don't know where that myth came from. I didn't realize it was in the, in the veterinary uh, community as well, but in the medical community, this has been a myth since 2003 when yeah. I first did the internet search and it's like, where did this come from? But it, but also it will not die. I've been pounding yeah. this for years and every day I get a comment, well, won't that, well, that protein's too hard for my kidneys. Right. And I just want to just give up and retire and go chop down trees all day. So now the next question. Somebody said in the comments, my vet said not to give my cat any food except for the kibble because the kibble contains taurine. And my cat has to have taurine or will get very sick, maybe go blind. What would What's your answer to that? You know, um, the, it, taurine is hugely essential for cats. It's got to have it. But I think every single commercial cat food in this country it has an AAFCO, the American Association of Field Control Officers. Every single commercial cat food is supplemented with taurine. So I don't think you're going to have a difference between the taurine level between uh, canned and dry. But They'll this woman, this woman was feeding her cat meat. I'm not joking. Yeah. Okay. And her, her vet said, don't do that. You've got to feed them the cat food or they won't get enough taurine. I mean, now, meat is one of the richest I sources. Of that. So yeah, I mean, how, how did that vet get that wrong? Yeah, the meat is, is one of the richest sources of taurine in the diet. You know, I, I will just throw a word of caution, though. Like, if we're just start adding uh, a lot of meat, this meat alone is not uh, a well-balanced diet. And, and the biggest thing is the calcium and phosphorus. Meat tends to be high in phosphorus and low in calcium. So they do need a calcium source, which, you know, um, basically bone meal. Uh, um, yeah. But to get that all balanced out is really tricky. And I always recommend you use, a, you know, a, a nutritionist for that if you're going to do like a homemade diet. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's great advice. And that's where our cats and dogs, they get their calcium from eating eggshells which they mm -hmm. all love. And then also a can of sardines once a week with the bones in and the skin on. And yeah. I think that probably makes it a, a fairly rounded out diet. Now, a lot of people in the comments are saying, I only feed my dog or cat grain free. It says it right there on the front of the, of the dog or cat food package. 
what are some caveats about that and some warnings? Is that if it says grain free on the front, is that is that a perfect food for cat and dogs? See, I've been back and forth on this grain free. There was a time where I thought it was going to create world peace, <laughs> I, uh, but I've kind of backed away from that. And then over the last number of years, we've had an issue. Uh, an, issue with uh, cardiomyopathy in dogs. This is specifically to dogs. And it's a dilated cardiomyopathy, which we typically only see um, in certain genetics of dogs or in cats that are on a taurine deficient diet. So it's interesting because like when you, you learn it like right away in vet school, cats have the specific taurine requirement. They have to get the taurine or else they'll get cardiomyopathy and blindness. But dogs, they don't have to have the taurine because they can convert other amino acids like cysteine and methionine to taurine. Um, so this, it's our, our field has been working very hard for a number of years trying to figure out what's causing this debilitative cardiomyopathy in dogs, and it's been associated with grain-free diets. The thing I never made sense to me on that is grains are not a good sense of uh, they're not a good source of like like taurine. You know, yeah. um, there's so, none actually in, in right. any grain or in any pea. And no so problem. I think I think what they're starting to find, though, I think it, it truly is a taurine deficiency in dogs. And this is just my crazy going I off. Agree. But I, I haven't been following it as closely lately. But um, I still think it's a taurine uh, deficiency. And it's hard to measure taurine accurately in the body. You can do serum levels, plasma levels, but it's not really <sighs> sure if that that's going to correlate with what's in the tissue. Yep. And if you're feeding the dog that's already kind of like on a marginally low protein diet, you know, grain free, you, you, you soon find out if you're formulating diets, meat is the most expensive ingredient, right? So then they start doing all these legume proteins um, and other, uh, you know, plant based proteins. Well, they don't have as much methionine and cysteine to convert to the taurine. So I right. really think it's all going to boil down to be a taurine deficiency, even still. Yeah, it and wouldn't surprise me. Dogs. It wouldn't surprise me at all. And from the limited research I've looked at, it looks like dogs may there there may be a spectrum of conversion of the other amino acids to taurine, much like in humans. Some of us can convert beta carotenoids from plants into vitamin A fairly well. Others of us can barely convert any of the vitamin A in plants into real actual retinol vitamin A. And I suspect that's the, there's a spectrum in in dogs that just like that when it comes to taurine. And I would not be shocked if you're exactly right about the many, many dogs have a taurine deficiency because they're not fed meat. And so everybody watching, when it says grain free on the package, I promise you, they did not replace the grains with meat. They, re <laughs> they replaced the grains with pea protein, which is also very cheap. And the protein, at least in humans, is very poor, poorly absorbed and used. And I would suspect the same is true for dogs and cats. Uh, so just because it says grain free does not mean it's made of meat. OK, and that's what both cats and dogs are carnivores to at least a large degree. Cats completely so. Uh, dogs, I think, are, are classified as facultative uh, carnivores, which means they, they need mostly meat, and but they can tolerate some starches and some other stuff. And I've actually seen uh, game cam video of wild coyotes grabbing ears of corn off corn plants. So if there's yeah. a, if there's a lean year, they'll add, they will absolutely eat corn off the cob, off the, off the plant, but that's not their primary food, their primary food. Let's just talk about that. What is the primary food for cats and dogs that they should, that, that the majority of their diet should be made up of. Well, you know, if you look at like wolves, we were talking about them earlier and you look at the analysis that they do on wolf diets, you know, and a lot of excellent research out of Yellowstone, um, you know, it's, it's like, like 45% protein or 45 to 55% protein, 45 to 55% fat, depending on if it's a bull or a cow in the time of year, what the animal is. It's just like almost zero carbohydrate, you know, close to zero. Um, and so I guess, you know, I, I get in these arguments with my colleagues, but I think until proven otherwise, we should try to mimic a species appropriate diet. And oh. I push back, you know, I was at a conference here a few years ago and this woman, she's, uh, she's double boarded and has a PhD and she teaches nutrition to the students and you know, she started off this lecture saying, you know, like cats are obligate carnivores and in nature only 3% of their calories from come, come from carbs. And I was just like, oh, finally, someone gets it. But then she turns around and spends the rest of the hour 
you know, defending carbohydrates up to 35% of their diet. You're like, oh my God, a tenfold increase in carbohydrate. And, you know, she looks at these studies where they can, they can metabolize and that some of the earlier studies, the carbohydrates weren't heavily processed enough. But if you heavily process, or she says properly processed, which means heavily processed the carbs, yeah, they can digest it, you know, but like, I just don't think they were meant to have that sugar bolus all the time, you know, and this, yeah. I, I'm a lunatic. So, but if, so what, what would happen is if everybody out there, if they just stopped feeding their cats kibble and either switched to a canned uh, cat food that's full of meat or just started making their cats their own food at home, like they do every other family member who they purportedly love. <laughs> Big companies like Hills, Science Diet, like Purina, Alpo, all these guys, their profits would tank. Now, is it is it true in veterinary school like it is in medical school? Do a lot of these big uh, pet food corporations, do, are they very friendly with veterinarians? Do they bring you samples? Do they buy you lunch? I, I don't know how it works. So walk us through that if any of that exists. Oh, yes, yes, and yes. I mean, they that's it. You know, we get all kinds of free stuff from them, you know, and free meals. And yeah, I mean, I think we're biased right from the start, you know, um, it just kind of like dentists and toothpaste companies, you know, it's like, it's, yeah, it's, it, I think it's really unfortunate. Oh, I totally agree. Pam has a question. The vet said her dog has pancreatitis caused by high fat and salty food. Is this true? What should I feed her? She's 13 and no teeth. Now that none of this is medical advice. It's also not veterinary advice. This is just right. two two doctors talking. But if Pam were your next door neighbor, what might you say out loud to her? Well, you know, uh, I will tell you, I think that is pretty well evidence-based. Dogs with pancreatitis, they do need a low-fat diet. And I usually use a prescription diet from one of the big food companies on those. I've had the most consistent luck with that. And I think the literature would support that. Gotcha. And what about has cat Sophia? Uh, she's her cat's got very dry skin. Any any uh, quick tips on dry skin in cats? Yeah. So I, once again, I have the same answer for everything: <laughs> canned food. You know. Um, and I think the other thing about this canned food, and I could be wrong about this, but I think most of them, if you look at the labels, which veterinary labeling sucks. I mean, it's terrible. Sorry, it, it is absolutely terrible. Um, but I, I I really think that if you get the canned food, so they're hydrated, and then you get the animal-based fats, you know, not vegetable oils. And you tend to have more vegetable oils in the dry food than the canned food. That's my understanding, but the labels are so bad, you can't, I can't say it with confidence. And then I also think, you know, like when you look at like the, the poultry and the pork in this country, you know, they're all fed corn and soybeans, so they tend to be higher in the omega-6s. So I tend to prefer, you know, like a, a beef-based um, one, because ruminants, can convert those other crappy polyunsaturated fatty acids to more appropriate fatty acid profile in the food. Yes. So, yeah. I know I have the same answer for everything, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, Zoe says, what are everybody's pets names? Everybody type your pets names into the comments. Our pets names are Dogga. That's our guardian dog for the sheep. Uh, Lily, Toto, our rescue dog. And then we have two cats, Loki and Olive. What are your pets names, doc? I have a cat named Apple, and then we have a dog named Ida and another dog named Alton. Nice, nice. I love it. My daughters, when, when they were growing up, they would always give cats and dogs human names, like they would name their cat Frank. I'm like, that's not a <laughs> cat name. What are you doing? Apple, that's a brilliant cat name, but Frank, come on. <laughs> or Bartholomew. Or so it's like, no, that is not, that's a human name. You name your children those names, not your dogs and cats, but I guess they thought that that was their children. Uh, let's but, you know, but can I just mention one thing to you, uh, just to kind of keep it simple, but like uh, you know, people like explain to them cats are obligate carnivores. They meant to eat, you know, animal based proteins and fats and all that. And then they're like, you know, like I, I can't afford these real expensive premium foods. And my point is like, I just think conventional, like friskies, classic pate, you know, fancy feast, you know, Sheba, I, I, I don't know that you have to have an expensive premium brand. Most of diabetics would reverse with on, was on the cheap stuff. So you know, is it true that the canned cat food kind of by definition is able to have a higher percentage of meat in it because it is canned and sealed? Exactly. Oh, interesting. So that just by switching to dry kibble, 
to canned food for cats. Not only are they going to get more meat because that that's just in there, and right. it, may, it may very well be ground up horse legs and and goats. But I promise you, and you uh, speak up, doctor, if you disagree, your cat won't care what animal it came from. Okay, it can be donkey buttholes; they do not care. They want meat. Uh, and uh, everybody's telling me the names of their pets, Sammy and Katie. This is hilarious. I love it. Lynn's got 11 dogs. I don't know if she named them all or not. That'd be, that'd be a hard sell, wouldn't it? So but I'm glad you brought that up because I have had an argument with a, another veterinarian who's real famous in this field and we agree on almost everything, but she disagrees with my advice that even the Chan, the cheap canned cat food is good because it has byproducts. I'm like, Oh my gosh. I mean, that's still animal-based tissue. Like, I don't, I'm not afraid of byproduct. I'm a fan of byproduct. Yeah, well, so byproducts would be organs, would yep. be ground-up bone meal, would be sinew, tendon, fascia. Yes. And yes. guess what? All the cats in the wild who are direct relatives of your cat, they mm -hmm. eat that stuff. What was the, the word they used? That byproduct. Byproducts. Yeah, that, you know, another word for byproducts? Meat. All right. Right. Yeah, that's what they yeah. want. You know, what, so I don't, I don't, this thing about byproduct it just really drives me crazy. And there's some marketing out there, you know, food does not contain byproducts. I'm like, oh, you just missed the healthiest part of the carcass because the heart, the liver, the kidney, the spleen, the thymus, the lungs, the like all that crap that we don't eat is so nutrient dense, you know. Like, yeah. And now the, your advice would apply to a, a house cat. Or to if we've got a mouser out in the barn, they're going to be eating mice. But yeah, they still they don't need to be eating dry kibble. It's not it's not it's really basically junk food for cats. Is that right. it, it is? That's a you know kibble for cats is just like uh, yeah junk food that you're stealing my line. You know it's like I tell my clients all the time. And if you if you take this seriously and you just do nothing but eliminate kibble from the home from your cats and feed a cheap canned cat food, you're really going to hurt my bottom line because. All these things that are keeping me busy every day, uh, they just tend to not show up or they show up at a much lower incidence. And yeah, well, I totally agree. So and and now for my uh for my guardian sheepdog, he yeah. gets he gets ground beef. I do buy him canned dog food because he he weighs 140 pounds and he would wow. literally break my bank if I had to feed him, you know, uh, ribeye every day, but he gets a, a three cans of, of canned dog food. So that's high in meat. And it also has the liquid that he needs. Uh, but also I'll throw some sardines in there. I'll throw some ground beef in there. And you're saying that dogs on average need a lower fat diet than humans. Is that right? Well, I think, you know, if you just look at their ancestral diet, you know, it depends on what they're eating. Like if they're living off rabbits, it's going to be really low fat meat. You know, if they're living off elk in the prime, it's going to be a lot higher fat. But yep. I just think the dogs, I think dogs need the high protein, moderate fat, very low carb, same as cats. Gotcha. So for cats or dogs, it needs to be very low in carbohydrates. Are there any, I'm not a veterinarian, are there any essential nutrients in plants or in carbohydrates that dogs or cats must have or need to have to no, be I think it, healthy? I don't think so. I mean, I, I understand there could be some, maybe some medicinal benefits of some herbal stuff, you know, but like, it's just like the carbohydrate requirement for dogs and cats is the same with people, you know, it's zero, as long as you have adequate protein and fat. Um, yep. And I get pushed back from some of my clients and, and there's this one, or not clients, but colleagues, uh, but there's this famous veterinarian and she's assured me that they're going to get some kind of phytonutrient deficiency. And I, like, how would I recognize that if I saw it, she has I'm not been able to explain that to me, but. Yeah. So which phytonutrients are essential for dogs and cats? What's the list? I say zero, you know, that's me, you know, I mean, but. I love it. So uh, very often, as you probably know, doctor, I'm, I'm having, uh, heated or uh, discussions with vegans on Twitter, right. and uh, there are many vegans who feed their dog and or cat a plant based diet or even a vegan diet because they're they think they believe that that's the healthiest for their their pet, but also it's it's good for the planet too. Is there any research that shows that a plant based or a vegan diet is is optimal for cats and dogs or or even beneficial for cats and dogs or 
is that a red flag that maybe they love their ideology more than they love their cat or dog? That's what I think, because I'm not aware of any research looking at outcomes. Now, okay, you can take a plant-based diet and you can, you know, throw all kinds of supplements and nutrients in there to make it meet that AFCO, that AFCO compliance. It'll have the, you know, the vitamins and mineral. I'm sure you can make it, you can make it uh, plant-based. Like, but I'm just not aware of any outcome data that's showing that it's uh, better for health. And my hypothesis would be that it's going to be less beneficial than a true species appropriate diet. But. Yeah, I, I think that I totally agree. And it, you know, I've got a confession to make doc, and this is embarrassing, but I want to, cause everybody, we all make mistakes. So I used to have a house dog years ago in a previous life who we tried to potty train, but he wound up chewing up all the, you know, the chuck pads that we put on the floor. So that actually made a bigger mess. So we finally just gave up, let him poop on the tile and we cleaned it up. And we went to the vet and the vet said, oh, there's a dog food that will make your dog poop these little dry turds that you can just, it's super easy to pick up. And the vet actually prescribed us a dog food to make him poop little dry turds. Now, it, obviously looking back now, I'm ashamed of that because I obviously right. didn't love that dog very much or I, I wouldn't have cared the consistency of his poop. I would have cared about the nutrition in his diet. But it, is there is that healthy to feed dogs or cats a diet that would make them have very easy to pick up poop? Yeah, I, I don't know, to, to be clear. Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> you, there's all kinds of different diets, and you can add fibers and different fibers. I, I will tell you there's, um, you know, ultra highly processed um, diet by Hill Science Diet, uh, I've had excellent luck with these dogs with chronically loose stools, and uh, uh, I'm shocked it works. I just kind of cringe when I read the ingredient label, but I'll be honest to goodness, you have these dogs that are having breakthrough diarrhea and accidents in the house and people are at work and school. I've been shockingly surprised at how effective it is. So, Yeah, and this is a very common question as well, Doc. Uh, Blue Dove says, why do dogs eat grass and leaves on their own if meat is all they need? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I've actually spent a heck of a lot of time looking into this. And the biggest, the best answer I can get after all this time I've wasted looking at this answer is they like it. You know, you look at wolves in nature, they chew on some grass. Yep. Um, you know, and, and when they look at that research out of Yellowstone, occasionally you find some plant, plant matter like that in there. I, I just think they like it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't yeah. think. Yeah. And, you know, the the kind of the old wives tale that my grandmother, Granny Berry, taught me was that dogs do that when they're feeling sick. They eat the grass to kind of do something to their gut. Uh, but I would say, Blue Dove, yes, occasionally your dog will go out and eat a few blades of grass. But the majority of the time, if you gave your dog a bowl of grass or a bowl of meat, I don't think I have to tell you which one your dog would smash and which one they would ignore. Uh, so perhaps dogs do like, and I'll tell you, Lily, our uh, standard poodle, I've got some hybrid willows actually growing in the house. I'm going to plant in the pasture for fodder. And uh, she's been nibbling the, the tips of the leaves off the hybrid willow, which is a very high protein, very tasty forage for, for sheeps and goats and cows. And, and I, I had to put them up out of her reach because she's been nibbling the leaves. Now I said nibbling, right? Well, what she does when we put her meat down is she smashes the meat and eggs but she nibbles on the, the hybrid uh, willow occasionally. Right, right. Yeah, you know, it's interesting too, like with dogs and eating grass, like I think it's just normal for them to be walking along the edge of the yard and they see some long blades of grass and they chew them off and they're, but yeah, they're just kind of munching a little bit. But it is interesting, like if you see a dog just like really going to town and mowing down a bunch of grass, it is often associated with uh, gastric distress or GI distress. And it's always a question of the chicken or the egg. Were they having some some GI distress, and that's why they tried to eat a bunch of grass to you know push the parasites through or whatever, um, or was it they overate the grass and now they have the GI distress? It's always hard to know on the chicken or the egg. So it's possible that Granny Berry was right all those years ago that the dog is trying to use the grass or the plants as a medicinal herb to treat right. a gastrointestinal condition. That's possible. Uh, a lot of questions in the comments about if I'm gonna feed my dog meat should it be raw meat or should it be cooked meat or some combination for dogs and cats both what do you say doctor 
Yeah, you know, this is the really contentious thing. And just so you know, our the veterinary field is just militant against raw diets. I mean, violently opposed. And so I always have to be careful what I say because my cat lives in the barn and she eats a lot of raw mice. I'm sure. I don't know how they feel. The academia. I academic. bet they're completely opposed to that. <laughs> right. And I do feed my dogs a raw diet. Um, but uh, our field is fiercely opposed to it. Um, so I, but I'll, I haven't said that. I mean, when I listen to some of the really strong raw food proponents, they're always talking about it has to be raw because if you heat it, you're going to destroy these enzymes. And I've never found that very convincing. And I could be wrong. Um, but for me, when I, you know, I got, we have, plus my daughter's, I've got three dogs are feeding. I just don't have time to cook all the stuff that I'm making. Gotcha. Now, what about eggs? Is it okay to give our dogs uh, raw eggs? Or should the eggs be cooked? Should they be over easy or sunny side up? Or is it okay to give them raw? And I'll, I'll just tell you before your answers, I might be embarrassed again. At least once or twice a week, I'll give our dogs either raw chicken eggs that came right out of the hen nest or mm -hmm. raw quail eggs that came right out of the quail hutch. Yeah, I, I feed uh, raw eggs to my dogs all the time, especially when I used to have chickens. Um, I don't cook them, but... Uh, but, you know, pe people worry about, you know, the risk of salmonella. But last I heard, like, the chance of getting salmonella from a raw egg is like one in 10,000 eggs or something ridiculous. Sure. Um, I think dogs and cats could probably handle that. But uh, I, I don't know, like, uh, if it's cooking. I know that changes some of the B vitamin that can people, right, if it's raw. I, so I, I just don't know is the honest answer. I don't think it's been closely looked at. But yeah. I, I, I always tell my clients. You know, meat, eggs, and fish, those are the most nutrient-dense foods you're going to get. The only thing that's going to beat it is the organ meats, you know. Um, right. So I, I'm a huge fan of incorporating those into the diet. Yeah, and anytime somebody asks me about the raw meat thing, uh, you may have to, if your dog's been on kibble their whole life or your cat, you may have to give them cooked meat for a while. And then uh, we've had hundreds of our followers who say, yeah, I did that. Now they just eat raw meat. So let's look at the evolution again, just for everybody to be very clear. All of all of these animals, the lion, the tiger, the cheetah, the panther, they all eat raw meat every day of their lives. Okay. And your cats are a direct descendant from the last common ancestor of those animals. Uh, the gray wolf eats almost 100% raw meat and raw eggs. And every single dog on the planet is descended from a gray wolf. Now, they've been in captivity with us for about 8,000 years, 9,000 years, Doc. Uh, being a veterinarian, is eight or 9,000 years, is that enough time <coughs> for evolution to make dogs and cats crippled to the point where they have to have kibble or they have to have cooked food? Yeah, I mean, I'm just, I know I'm so biased and I irritate some of my colleagues in the veterinary community, but I just think a, a species appropriate diet is rarely going to be kibble. Uh, and, and now Purina, I've gotten a call from them while we're live. They said they do not appreciate this video whatsoever. Uh, <laughs> that, that we're, no, I'm kidding about that, but yeah. So yeah, you know, hopefully because I've actually, they owe me money because I put more, you know, I like, say like friskies and fancy, but that's all Purina products. I just had excellent luck with it, but you know, I don't like their kibbles. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I totally understand. So let's see if we can get it. I'm going to take some questions from the audience, if that's okay, Doc. Uh, if any of you guys have a question about your cat or dog that you need to get answered, you can include it in a super chat. It bumps it up uh, to the top of the list. Mario says his dog loves raw meat. Let's see what I can find here. Uh, Beef liver for the win. There you go. Come on, guys. Now's your chance. Uh, okay. Do you have an opinion on the Dr. Marty freeze-dried high-protein dog food? I don't. I don't know enough about it to have an opinion. Okay. Do dogs' uh, mental health, might, will it possibly improve if you take the carbs out like it does in some humans? See, I think so. And, you know, the dogs get this thing called cognitive dysfunction syndrome. It's basically doggy Alzheimer's. And... <laughs> You know, I, I could be fooling myself here. Just going off someone's clinical observations is not as good as looking at RCTs, but they right. don't exist. But, uh, but yeah, I, I, I really think so. And I just think that hyperinsulinemia and those glucose spikes and advanced glycation on products. And I have, I'm for, I have a, before I retired, I had quite a few raw feeders coming to me. So I was not that I recommend it, but I was one of the few vets 
<laughs> maybe the only vet in our area that just didn't beat them up and, you know, give them a hard time over feeding raw food. Yep. I've seen many of these dogs for many, many years, and I just cannot believe how well they age. And I might be fooling myself, but uh, I, I think there's something to it. Yeah, and I've actually gotten from a couple of uh, guardian dog breeders who have, because, you know, guardian dogs are on average very large dogs, which is going to limit their their age limit. Right. You know, they're not going to live as long as a smaller dog. But every single tra tra ra uh, breeder says if you'll feed them a raw food diet, they will live longer than the, you know, the suggested with like the average. And they said they've seen that many, many times. Uh, Making Smile says her five-year-old Chihuahua has Cushing's and is, she's been giving the cat boiled chicken and veggies on 30 milligrams of Veneril. Any recommendations on that situation? No, it sounds like that, that Veneril, is the, that's the best drug I've ever used in my career for Cushing's. So. Okay. So, so boiled chicken and veggies, that's a good, that's good for the cat. It, now, oh, are, oh, is, it, is it a cat or a dog? It's a Chihuahua. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I, I think for a brief time that diet would be okay, but in the long run, I always recommend working with a nutritionist. You got to get that calcium and phosphorus and some of those other micronutrients, right? I mean, that would be fine for a short feeding, but in the long run, you really need to work with somebody who needs to be balanced. Gotcha. Okay. Now's the time to ask questions. If you have them, folks, I'm trying to find, uh, Rita says, I add salt and potassium to my dog food. Is that okay? See, once again, it's kind of hard to know if you don't know what the baseline diet is. Right. But right. I do think I've seen some evidence that if you're doing like home feeding, it's actually important to add the salt, you know, and, and everyone's using like, you see, you got some Redmond's behind you. That's what I have at my house. Yeah. I put that on my dog's food. But yeah, I, I about at least once or twice a week, I'll put some Redmond's real salt on the yeah. cats and the dog's food. Uh, I'm sure they're getting <laughs> salt from other sources, but I just want to make sure they're getting plenty. Yeah, and then I also like to use regular table salt, so they're getting iodine too. You know, um, iodinized table salt, like regular salt, like we buy at the grocery store. Yep, I, I think uh, I think it seems prudent. I don't know if there's any. Yep, yeah, gotcha. K Bulk says fasting a dog for a day or so is that a bad idea? So what about fasting for dogs and cats? Any recommendations or cautions? <laughs> you know, it's interesting. That's why I like being on Twitter. I got contacted from this researcher in South Africa because. People ask me all the time, like, oh, we don't really have any studies. And she sent me a study from some European um, veterinary deal, which I never would have found. But uh, it, it was a really limited study. It was small, but it kind of showed a lot of the same benefits they show on people. So I have my dogs. Uh, I do a lot of fasting myself. And I have my dogs up maybe once a quarter and do like a 48-hour fast where they don't eat for 48 hours. I don't know is the honest answer, but there, there is some limited support, but it needs to be researched better. Yeah, I totally agree. It sense to me, like when you look at wolves, you know, like they make a kill, you know, an elk or a deer, and they just gorge themselves for a day or two, and then they just lay around for a day or two, and then they're back on the hunt. So, like, it just seems to me like that feast famine kind of cycle. Like, we don't mimic that at all when we're doing, you know, two meals a day, twenty four, three sixty five. Like, it, 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 intuitively, it makes sense, but I just don't think we have much research on it. Yep, I, I totally get it. Uh, so if somebody had a very obese dog or obese cat uh, that they're feeding two or three times a day, uh, would you recommend let's let them eat until they're full at one meal a day or maybe uh, do alternate day fasting? Or would you recommend any kind of fasting for a, a severely overweight dog or cat? You know, so for the uh, dogs, um, I have been playing around with just going to OMAD, you know, one meal a day. And I really felt like it was kind of moving the needle. I still think that's probably less important than the quality of the diet. And with cats, um, you know, there's there's different things. Some people say, like, you know, cats in nature, they eat like six times a day because they catch a mouse or two and they nap. And catch. But then I came across another article that showed actually, uh, and I wish I would have saved the article. I got it off Twitter, of course. But it was um, it was feeding cats once a day and for weight loss. And it was a... So the diets were similar, but they were they showed better results having one meal a day, which is interesting because in veterinary medicine, there's always a lot of worry about cats getting um, fatty liver disease. It's a little bit different than like with the fatty liver disease you're working with people, but um, they get it when they get anorexic. And so it's always this concern. If you don't feed cats up constantly, they're going to get fatty liver. But 
they didn't show it in that study. Once again, it was a small study, but I, I think in cats, I usually like to feed them uh, two to three times a day. If we're having trouble with weight loss, I go down to twice a day. If it's dogs, I've had personal luck with once a day, but I, I'm just telling you my clinical experience. I can't back all this up with randomized control trials. Gotcha. Uh, uh, okay. Now here's a great question. I, I have a, this is one of my pet peeves. Should adult dogs and cats be given milk? Yeah. See, this is kind of controversial too. They, they, they don't have that enzyme, right. To break down the lactose. And so Having said that, you know, in my younger days, I used to do some large animal work and I'd see these, if you go to a dairy to go treat some cows and these cow, cats are drinking milk all the time. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't honestly know. I, I kind of suspect that it would, might be better if it's fermented, you know, so mm -hmm. do some lactose, but I don't, I just don't know. Gotcha. Uh, so, I mean, the, I think that by definition, every adult cat and every adult dog is lactose intolerant yeah they don't have lactase persistence like humans do right so they they have lactose when they're in that neonatal period but it, it drops off pretty quickly in life gotcha uh, oh here's a, a rabbit question what are the safest treats for rabbits i don't know anything about rabbits <laughs> i would just say follow a species appropriate diet mimic something they would get in nature yes. what would rabbits eat in the wild uh celiac revelation uh also keep in mind rabbits are herbivores obligate herbivores i think now right. rabbits actually facultated because i've seen video of rabbits eating meat they will do it but they mm -hmm. want they want predominantly plants right and so some right. plant-based treat for your diet, uh, some plant-based thing that you bought for yourself that tastes like crap, you can maybe give it to your rabbit. I, I think rabbits and horses, these hind gut fermenters, I just consider them obligate, you know, uh, herbivores. But yeah, yeah. Brian says uh, they feed their English bulldog instinct raw. Is that okay? Probably, you know, I, I, I've had excellent results with my clients that are feeding that. Um, but that's just my clinical experience. I wish I could point to good trials. Um, Nisha says that's very expensive dog food and she has some experience with it. And uh, I, I would say kind of a blanket statement for everybody watching, buy food that's, that has at least a lot of meat, if not predominantly meat for both your dog and your cat. Would you agree with that, doctor? Yeah, I would. You know, it's interesting. I was on a Twitter debate with this guy, a veterinarian over in the UK. Really respectful guy. I, I admire his work. Just a huge fan of his. But then in the thread, he was going to bat to say carbohydrates are fine. And and I just proposed like a thought experiment. You know, like, okay, let's just say there's this crazy change in the markets. And now all of a sudden, refined carbohydrates are super, <coughs> you know, plant-based are really expensive but like meat whole meat carcass is is dirt cheap you know would the would these commercial producers change their formulas i think you and i both know they would yeah oh, and, absolutely and, and then the question is i asked i said do you think there would be any change in health outcomes and he refused to uh consider that you guys i'm not a fan of thought experiments and <laughs> especially <laughs> that one because, Einstein was a big fan of thought experiments, but I think it's an interesting thought experience. And, and my, my hypothesis is that you would have better health. Um, I, I know because it's interesting that these pet food companies, they always assure you that these foods have been created to maximize the nutritional benefits. And I'm like, if that's the case, then if the meat goes cheap and the grains go high, you better not reformulate your stuff because you've already assured us, but I don't, I think they would reformulate it and I think it would be more helpful. So uh, let me ask you this, Doc. Are there any federal guidelines or regulations about the labeling of dog food like there are there is for human food? So if, if Purina wanted to put on the front of their bag guaranteed to help your dog live longer, is that must that be based on randomized control research in dogs or can they just put that bullshit on their front of their label or at least imply it? With really yeah, nothing see, to back it up. There's a lot of regulations on that, and I don't, I don't know them. But you know, like you can put like all natural or holistic. I, there's stuff. There's terminology you can and can't use, and I don't, I don't know all the regs. Because I know in the old days there was a dog food that was actually they advertised to help your dog live, help your loved one live longer. I think Sally worded it, but I don't see that any much anymore. Now uh, Tiffany has a question. 
in my human patients, I say you need to eat until you're comfortably stuffed if you're eating a proper human diet. Does that apply to dogs and cats as well? Do they get to eat to satiety if you're giving them a meat-based diet or should you portion control them or calorie restrict? Yeah, so that's, I think, the beauty with cats <laughs> is because I think you know, when, they, when they're eating that canned food, you know, it's like, I think the weight of the food has a certain satiety effect to it. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think in cats, that's why I have better luck with canned. And I think I have better luck with dogs too, honestly. But it's just, I understand those of us with big dogs to feed how many cases per week it would take. It's just not feasible. But I don't think dogs always get that satiety signal. Uh, some breeds do, some breeds don't, but it, notoriously like Labradors, they just, they don't have a, a full button switch, you know, it's just, yep. they just keep eating and eating. Um, Cause I have people tell me all the time, it's like, well, they should naturally quit eating when they're full. I'm like, I wish that could be the case. And then here's the other thing. Most of our pets, we've um, neutered them, right? They're spayed or castrated. And um, we know that that really affects their, um, their appetite and it affects their metabolisms because they're, they're kind of like doubly screwed, you know? Right. So, I, th I think, uh, yeah, I, I would like to say, I, I usually going to take some, um, I wish I could say we could just time restrict their feeding, but I think a lot of times you're going to have to not just time restrict. I think you're going to have to calorie calorically restrict, but in that case, in like, uh, I think you got to find a way to give the greatest satiety per calorie of food. And that means protein. That means meat, right? So I just think it's going to put it in your favor. I love that. That I think that's a great way of thinking about this. If the food is it stretches the stomach, if it's nutrient dense, if it's very satiating, then that that's probably going to prevent them from overeating. And I would I would guess that uh, maybe no research done in cats and dogs about kibble, but I bet a cat or a dog just out of boredom will just sit and crunch on kibble. Uh, John says that his car loves ice cream. I'm pretty sure that he meant to say his cat loves ice cream. That's a weird pet if your car indeed eats ice cream. What about treats? I remember used to at, at Petco or PetSmart, they had a, a doggy treat dessert bar, like a like a salad bar where you could go and get your doggy little treats and put in a bag and buy it by the pound. Do, do cats and dogs, do they need treats? Do they need desserts? Do they need to lick John's ice cream? Yeah, I don't think they need any of that. I'm a big fan of uh, not giving treats. You know, I think they, they should have time between meals where their stomach's empty, empty their insulin levels are low. Uh, you know, if you have a really healthy dog and cat, I'm sure they could tolerate it. I, I tell people, if you're going to feed treats, I just like it to be meat-based treats, you know. So, but Our I can't, dogs love meat-based treats. Right. Yes. So use that. I'm not a fan of those crispy treats. I'm not a fan of those, like, milk bones and stuff like that. I'm just, I'd rather just have it be a, a meat-based treat. Here's a great question. It, do dogs and cats, it, the dental health, right? Because dogs and cats can absolutely get cavities and dental abscesses. That absolutely can happen. Is it related to diet? Would you expect more cavities and dental abscesses with a, with a kibble diet or with a can diet or with a meat diet? Yeah, so that's another one of those myths is that uh, kibble, you know, kibble is good for cleaning the teeth. It has a scrubbing action that cleans it. I just think that's a bunch of crap, and I don't think there's really any good studies to support that. Um, but yeah, periodontal, periodontal disease is huge. That's the number one disease in veterinary medicine, affecting 70% of the pets over three years of age. I mean, it's, it is huge. But it's interesting, I mean, when I first started getting into this raw food feeding, you know, I was against it violently for years, like the way I was taught. Uh, but I, I kept um, looking at these people's dog's teeth, I'm like, oh my God, I just... You know, this dog's like eight years old, has the teeth of like a, a one-year-old. It's just unbelievable. That is one of the biggest things that people tell me when they're feeding raw. Now, having said that, if you're doing like raw patties on all the meat's already ground, I don't think you get the same benefit of the people that are doing like meaty bones, you know, like um, like chicken wings and um, turkey necks and stuff like that. Those are the dogs I see with the most profound good teeth. Um, I could be wrong. Yeah, no, I think you're totally right. Uh, actually, recently, Nisha took one of the dogs to the vet and the vet tech, not the vet, but the vet tech said, don't feed your dog anything that you wouldn't hit yourself in the knee with, uh, meaning dogs don't need to eat bones. Now, I literally said that out loud in a veterinary office, which I, I just I had to, you know, 
count to 20, uh, not to go back up there and be like, what the hell? But there is this uh, pervasive uh, idea that I've heard since I was a child is that you should only feed dogs and cats raw bones, never cooked bones, because the cooked bones might shatter and perforate their GI tract. Is that true or is that just another myth? Well, see, that's what the conventional wisdom is. And the, the, the conventional wisdom is just don't give any bones. There's too high a chance they're going to crack a tooth. Or, but I do think if you're going to do bones, although it's really controversial, I do bones. But I think it's best with the raw. I really do. Okay. Um, but, uh, that, that you know, that's like I, any veterinarian's listen is just cringing, hitting their head against the table right now. You know, Travis said you could feed bones. No, I'm not recommending it. But if you're going to feed bones, I think it's better to be raw, you know, uncooked. Gotcha. Yeah, they do. Because, like, I've, I, you look at these, like, I'll just tell you an experience, like, I had earlier in my career. You know, it's in the day, you're trying to get home, and it's phone call rings, like, oh, my God, my dog just ate, like, a whole case of turkey thighs. We set it out, you know, to defrost so we can cook it. I'm like, oh, my God, now I'm going to have to do an emergency gastrotomy and all this stuff and come on in, you know, and it's like this dog's jumping up and down, eating treats out of my hand, you know, and you, you x-ray the dog and uh, it's like everything's passing through. Now, having said that, if that dog would have got into cooked turkey thighs, it'd be a whole different deal. Okay. And that's just an example, but like, yeah, but, but I do think the kind of bone, you have to look at these forums online. There is a lot more knowledge than I can share with you. Gotcha. Now, Mario, we've already covered this, but let's recover it because I think it's such a, a very important issue for cats for sure, but probably for dogs as well. The role of taurine uh, in, in dogs and cats health. Yeah, I see. I think it's critical. Uh, obviously, in cats, we've known this forever. But I think this with this cardio uh, cardiomyopathy in dogs, I think it's coming to light. And I, I could be wrong. Maybe there's something else going on, but I think it's going to come out as a taurine deficiency. And I just don't think you're going to get a taurine deficiency if you're eating meat, right? Because you're getting the taurine in there. You're also getting the methionine that can convert and the cysteine that can, you're getting everything you need. And I think some breeds might have higher taurine levels than others still. Uh, like you were saying, like that your idea on beta carotene and vitamin A, you know, some, and some people can convert it pretty well. Some can't hardly at all. I think we're going to find similar differences um, in, in pets, but if you're feeding any commercial canned cat food, I don't think you have to worry about a taurine deficiency. All of them are supplemented. But if you're doing um, diets for dogs that are grain-free, not that there's any magical taurine grains, any significant amount, but uh, you got to watch and see what kind of plant-based proteins they're adding. <laughs> yep. And by in my research, Doc, there is no taurine in any grain or any legume whatsoever. You have to eat meat to get taurine, or the pet food manufacturer has to add taurine to yeah. the kibble to get it in there. There's no taurine whatsoever. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, in any grain or any bean or pea or legume, there is no taurine whatsoever. Uh, for my I, I, yeah, I guess I don't know the absolute amounts, but I just know that, like, in general, plant-based uh, foods aren't going to have. Gotcha. Making Smiles has been told that uh, feeding fish to her cat can cause UTIs. Is this true? I've never heard that. It doesn't make any common sense, but uh, so you <laughs> haven't seen any pattern of uh, fish eating cats getting UTIs? No, I haven't. I have a lot of cats on canned fish, you know, fish canned foods, and I just, I've never heard that or seen that that I'm aware of. Gotcha. Any concerns about feeding your cat uh, tuna out of the can or salmon out of the can, cod liver oh, out of the can? I think it's that all excellent. I recommend all of them. Excellent. Okay. Beautiful. And then I, also, I, I just, like I always say, just be careful that that's not the exclusive diet because it's not going to be balanced, you know. But like if you're feeding a good, um, well formulated food, I think you can safely have like 20% of their calories coming from just stuff like you mentioned. Gotcha. Um, so Janet had a cat that lived 18 years on 10 sardines. <laughs> you know, that's interesting. I had a case one time years ago and it was, uh, it was a weird case, but they, 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 people adopted this cat after a death in the family. And that cat had been on nothing but, um, but, but canned tuna, you know, for all these sardines and some sardines. And I end up calling a nutritionist like, oh my God, what do I look for? Like, how bad is this cat going to be screwed up? And she assured me it's probably not going to be that bad. And the cat checked out perfectly healthy. So, 
Nice. Uh, Susan says, uh, are brassicas okay to feed? Yeah, uh, she doesn't specify, but let's just talk about dogs and cats. Who's eating a mostly meat diet, and she adds some olive oil for satiety and some omega-3s. Uh, brassicas, are they okay? See, I don't know. You know, I know that they can have like some trips and inhibitors and other anti-nutrients. I don't feel comfortable with them. Having said that, that famous vet online who's, um, you know, she thinks that they need all these phytonutrients. She would disagree with me. So I, I just kind of avoid the brassica, but I just don't know. It's just not a species appropriate diet in my mind. Um, you know, as far as like the olive oil, I, I, I don't know. Again, uh, I, I would say if you're having problems with satiety, you need to up the protein and probably moderate the fat. And if you are going to do a fat source, I think probably the best fat source would be like something like beef towel. Lisa's vet, uh, son's vet actually told them that uh, seafood will cause UTIs in cats. Okay, I, I could be wrong. I mean, that makes zero sense, but maybe, but de definitely reach out to me later, Doc, if you find some research showing that seafood or fish causes cats to have UTIs. I'll be blown away, but I'll definitely publish that if you find any evidence supporting that. But I, 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 don't, um, I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, let's see. <laughs> uh, what about hard-boiled eggs? What about meat jerkies for treats? Excellent. Fantastic. Absolutely. Excellent. Okay. Let's see. Oh, somebody feeds their dog uh, raw tripe, uh, which is stomach, intestine. That's okay? You're okay with that? Yeah. You know, I, like I say, I, all the conventional vets are going to disagree with me, but when I've, just what I've experienced in my clients feeding that, I'm remarkably impressed by the health of their dogs. Oh, here's a good question. I don't know. I don't think this is true, but does cooking destroy the taurine in meat? See, I don't know how labile the taurine is, but in general, I think as long as it's not heavily cooked, it should be fine is what my guess would be, but I'm not 100% sure. That would be my guess as well, because obviously cooked steak still is a great source of taurine. Uh, right. I would I would guess the taurine's an amino acid, so I think it probably is going to, as long as you don't cook it at 700 degrees, it's probably going to be fine. Doc, uh, Michelle wants your opinion. Is raw better? <laughs> well, that's what I am feeding my dogs. So I guess you can read into that what you will. But gotcha. uh, that, I think that answers it right there. Uh, let's see. What else? Anything, uh, Doc, that we've covered that we haven't covered that you think we should cover? No, I think that about does it. Oh, man, it's such a pleasure to chat with you. Thank you so much for doing this. You've answered so many questions today. Uh, wrap, wrap this up. Is there any, um, uh, hopefully you're working on a book <laughs> about this because that would be awesome. Also, you talked about a book in another video, uh, Dogs, Dog Food and Dogma. Yes. Yeah, yeah, Dogs, Dog Food and Dogma. I mean, I think, uh, you know, when I went on my low carb journey and, got so much health benefits. I, I could not wrap my mind around what was going on. And I didn't really understand it until <laughs> Gary Tobbs, um, good calories, bad calories was really what I think enlightened me. But uh, I think that's the closest thing to a Gary Tobbs we have in our field is Daniel Shuloff's book, Dogs, Dog, Dogs, Dog Food and Dogma. And I've got a link to that down in the show notes. If anybody wants to check that out, I've actually read it. I've got a copy. It's, uh, it's, it's exactly in line with everything I talk about, about human nutrition, he's talking about in dog nutrition. And I think most of what he says applies to cats as well. Uh, so it, what about taurine, Doc? One last question. Is taurine in tuna? Does tuna have taurine? I don't know off the top of my head. But, you yeah. know, the, when I, when I, I, the reason I don't think I'm seeing these cardiomyopathies with grain-free diets is because all the my patients are on that are on a high meat diet. But I also wonder about other things. Like maybe taurine is fine being slightly lower as long as you have plenty of carnosine and carnitine and all these other amino acids. But if you're, if, if you're having a diet that's really deficient in carnosine and car, carnitine, maybe all of a sudden it just takes a little bit of blip and, you know, other amino acids to, to knock things out of balance. I just don't know. But I just, as hard as we've been looking to find a cardiomyopathy in these dogs, we have been un unable to find one. Gotcha. And then final question, Wendy's got a dog who had pancreatitis. I think you've already answered this for someone else, 
Uh, a couple of times, a couple of episodes of pancreatitis and the vet's insisting on an extremely low fat diet. Is this necessary? Can he eat raw meat like the others? Yeah, I, I, in my clinical experience, I've had the best luck with these prescription low fat diets with that. But I have often wondered if you did like a really low fat raw or, or, or can diet, you know, um, can meat diet, if you could have similar benefits. I just don't know. But right now that it's, it's pretty evidence-based. When you have pancreatitis, you need to be on a low-fat diet. Gotcha. All right, Doc. Thank you so much for taking the time and answering all these questions. It's been a pleasure. Everybody, you're welcome to share this video. If you have a, a pet lover you're acquainted with, send them a link to this. And uh, Doc, I'm excited uh, for your new book that'll be coming out in just a few months about the proper pet diet. <laughs> because if you're not working on that, you need to get busy because people are hungry for this kind of information because all the big plant uh, pet food manufacturers have misled everybody, in, including veterinarians. So thank you for your time, doctor. And I'll see you next time. All right. Take care, Ken. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.